Okay. Um, so I want to first thank the the organizers of the session for, um, well, for selecting this important topic and for inviting us to speak. Um, so I want to try and pick up where Kira left off and um, and begin to talk about models of or more comprehensive models of living organisms. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little. I'll give some more in, uh, background on the field and also. Um, uh, try to get you up to speed in, um, uh, in sort of the state of the art in the field and provide some results from our own work. Um, so, so my work at least has been a collaboration um, among several other people, including uh, Marcus Covert, who's a professor at Stanford, uh, and J.D. Dasangvi, who no now works in private industry. So, um, so as Akira started to introduce, uh, cells are composed of a large number of, of physiological processes, and each of these physiological processes are carried out by biochemical networks. Um, so if in the example of, of Mycoplasma genitalium, which Akira introduced, one of the things that it does is it colonizes your, your genital tract, and uh, it does that by expressing a large number of surface proteins, uh, which is it uses to interact with the epithelial cells. Um, so in order to do this, mycoplasma has to import nutrients from the external environment, has to then turn those nutrients into nucleic acids and amino acids. So then it uses that to synthesize DNA, uh, to synthesize RNA, and then ultimately to synthesize protein. Uh, so as Akira also introduced, we have a lot of technology for uh, probing these biochemical networks. We have DNA sequencing, that's probably the, the most well-known, at least outside biology. So we can use that to sequence the, the sequence of the genome. We can use it also to quantitate the expression of RNA. We can, or many other technologies for quantitating the abundance levels of RNA and protein. <coughs> um, and then from this, what we call high throughput data, uh, which is basically just to say a, a large amount of data, um, we can infer interactions among these the components in, in these cells, uh, and from that build what we call networks, um, which is b basically just a list of all their reactions. Uh, from that, build statistical models. Um, and we can do this not just for microorganisms, but we can also do it for patients. Um, and we, can, we can do it for human biology. Um, and in the case of human biology, we're assembling this information to, into what we call electronic medical records. Um, but despite having all this data and having some rough understanding of all the physiology inside cells, we don't have any comprehensive understanding of how cells work. So that's, that's really the goal of our field is to take all this data and to try and assemble it together into a unified theory of a cell. So, so this is really a central challenge in bio, oops, actually, before I introduce that. So I just wanted to share some my own thoughts on and why I think this field is important and what motivates me to work in the field. Um, so the first is biological discovery. So if we can build models which predict how a biological organism works, we can then use those models to make predictions, compare them to experiments, uh, and use that to derive discovery. Um, second thing we, we can do is we can engineer cells. So if we can build a model which, say, predicts the rate at which a, uh, a bacterium produces a biofuel, then we can use that model to reason about how to make that bacterium produce that biofuel at a faster rate. And then a third possibility, and this is really what motivates me, is that if we can build models of, of human patients, we can use that to reason about uh, a patient's most likely diagnosis or their most likely, um, uh, or, or select a combination of therapy tailored to that patient. So you could imagine in the future a patient, let's say a cancer patient would come into a clinic, and we would then uh, sequence uh, or take a biopsy that from that patient, sequence their tumor, and then you'd send that data to someone like myself who might plug it into a, a mechanistic model, and from that mechanistic model, you'd predict the most likely disease progression for that patient and select some combination of drugs based on that pr patient's particular genetic sequence. So, um, so this is really a central challenge in biology. Uh, Masur Tumita, who's one of the, the founders of our field of systems biology, has written that uh, wholesome modeling is a grand challenge of the 21st century. Uh, Sidney Brenner, who found, is a Nobel laureate and, and founded much of the field of, of worm biology, has written that biology urgently needs a, a theoretical basis to unify it. Um, and here's a third quote from Clyde Hutchison, who has pioneered DNA sequencing, or D sorry, DNA synthesis techniques at the Craig Venture Institute. Uh, he's written that the ultimate test of understanding a simple cell is to be able to build a computer model of one. 
So, uh, so what are some of the challenges that we face in trying to build co computer models of cells? So, so one challenge is that these biochemical networks which, which power these uh, biological processes, uh, these different networks have, di have different structures and that makes them amenable to different mathematical te techniques. So what you see in the literature is that people use different mathematical techniques to represent these different um, physiological uh, pr processes and networks. Uh, a second challenge is that although we do have a lot of data in biology, in general, the data is sparse. We don't have enough data to completely characterize a cell. So we're tr attempting to build a, a theory of a cell um, from, uh, from incomplete data. Uh, another problem is that although we have a lot of different technologies, no one of these technologies can be used to completely characterize a cell. So we're attempting to stitch together a theory uh, from many different types of data. Uh, and in many cases, we're, we're stitching it from, uh, stitching together data from multiple labs, from multiple experimental conditions, uh, and from multiple organisms. Uh, and a more fundamental challenge is that we're attempting to predict how cells behave uh, over multiple orders of length and time. So we want to be able to predict how a cell behaves from the level of individual molecules. And we want to be able to predict from the, the time scale of maybe individual reactions all the way up to the time scale um, of, of the cell cycle of a multicellular organism. So uh, as Akira introduced, uh, this isn't a new goal. Um, so Akira started in, in, 19, in the 1940s. I'll start a little bit later in the 1970s. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, people start to take what are called or, uh, coarse-grained ordinary differential equation approaches to build comprehensive models of cells. Uh, and one of the most notable projects was from Michael Schuler's group at Cornell. Uh, the, the main limitation with these uh, ODE approaches that Akira introduces, we tend not to have enough data. So in the 1980s and 1990s, people started to develop techniques which required less data and allowed them to build more comprehensive models. Um, so the, the, the latest of, of the, this variety of, of models has been able to account for about 30% of all of the genes in a cell. Uh, and the most successful technique is something called flux balance analysis, which has been used to model microbial metabolism. But so the problem with these kinds of approaches is that they're very qualitative. You, you can't use them to make quantitative predictions. And they make a lot of assumptions which prevent you from uh, applying them to model all of cell physiology. So what we've been trying to do over the last several years in the field is to come up with new ways which allow us to build more comprehensive models um, and allow us to build models which account for every gene in a cell. Uh, so that's what we've been, that my, that's what my group has been able to do over the last several years. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that even though we, we can now build models which account for every annotated protein, even in the best annotated genomes, so in, even in the best experimentally characterized uh, organisms, we can still only account for maybe as much as 75% of all the genes because you have 25% of the genes which haven't been experimentally characterized at all. So what I'd like to talk about in, in the next 10 minutes or so is um, some of the, the latest approaches for modeling bi biological organisms and, and uh, modeling all of their physiological processes, how we think about validating these models to, to give us some confidence in their predictions, and then uh, a little bit about how we're starting to think about using these models to engineer cells. <coughs> um, so Akira already introduced mycoplasma genitalium. Um, much of my work and much of our field has focused on this bacterium, uh, just to remind you, because it has a very small number of genes. So it has the smallest genome among all known free, freely living organisms. So it has just 525 genes. Uh, and it's also physically small, so it has a small number of molecules. So if you want to keep track of individual molecules in your simulation, um, this is a, a system which simply has a small number of molecules. So uh, as a modeler, one of the reasons why mycoplasma is, is interesting is that there's also a, a large amount of experimental data that's available. Um, and in particular, there, there's one group in Spain at the C Center for Regulatory Genomics, which has published an enormous amount of data on a re related species called Mycoplasma pneumonia. So in addition to that, there's also a couple of uh, um, bioengineering tools which are only applicable, cur only currently applicable to mycoplasmas. Uh, 
uh, and those include uh, techniques for large-scale chemical synthesis of DNA, uh, which have been pioneered at the Craig Venter Institute, and techniques for transplanting genomes into recipient cells. So what you can, you can now do, although it, it's not cheap, uh, you can actually take a, com a sequence of a genome that you have in a computer, synthesize a, a chemical <coughs> molecule which encodes that sequence, and actually transplant that into a recipient cell and boot that up. And that recipient cell will then have the phenotype of the, of the genome that you inserted, not the phenotype of the genome which was originally in that, in that recipient cell. So the solution that, that we've been pursuing in the field uh, and, and a few other groups have as well, is, is to take what we call an integrative approach. And the basic idea is that we can model a whole cell by breaking it down into submodels, each of which represent different physiological processes. Uh, and then what we can do is, um, is we can model each of these processes uh, using different mathematics. So we can build a flux balance analysis model of metabolism, um, at the same time that we can use ordinary differential equations uh, that Akira introduced to model uh, something like cell division, and we can take stochastic approaches to model transcription or translation. So this allows us to kind of combine different mathematical methods which work uh, better on, on certain kinds of networks. And the way that, that we integrate these together is through what we call um, cell state variables that represent sort of the, in the instantaneous configuration of a cell at every point in its life cycle. So they represent things like the cell shape and mass, uh, the, the abundance of metabolites, RNA, and protein molecules, uh, and everything else that's in a cell. So the, the way that we simulate the algorithm is we, we take, at each time to point in the simulation, we take these cell state variables, we simply pass their values to these submodels, you execute these submodels, um, update the, these cell state variables, and then you just repeat thousands of times to build up the dynamics of the entire cell cycle. So overall, it's roughly analogous to an OD in integrator, uh, where we've, we've just replaced your the state variables in your OD system with this more complicated data structure, and where we've replaced the differential equations with these submodels. Um, so in, in our most recent uh, model of mycoplasma genitalium, we, we've had models of 28 different cellular uh, processes. So one of the main challenges in, in this field, once you've built this structure for, for modeling is to identify all the model parameters. And the reason this is challenging is that once you build the, these models, they tend to be computationally expensive. So d despite having teraflops of computational power, they can still take a long time to execute, and they have a large number uh, of parameters that you might need to identify. So one way that, that you can attempt to reduce the complexity of, of this problem is to use what we call reduced models. The basic idea is that rather than using a computationally expensive model, you replace that with something which is less computationally uh, expensive, but which is a, an approximate version of, of your full model. Uh, and then you, you would apply numerical optimization to identify um, the values of, of your parameters with this reduced model. And then you, you simply plug them back into your full model. Um, and then if you need to, you can maybe manually tune some parameters in your full model. Okay, so w the really thing, the really cool thing about these kinds of models is that they make really detailed predictions about the physiology of, of living organisms. Um, so this is an animation of one in silico cell. The growth rate of this cell is depicted in blue at the top left. Uh, at the top right, we've illustrated the size and shape of the cell as it grows, uh, elongates, and divides. And in the middle left panel, we illustrated the rates of reactions inside the cell. Uh, in the middle right panel, we've illustrated the size of an important protein complex, uh, which forms to separate the strands of the chromosome to initiate replication. And in the bottom two panels, we've given two representations of the positions of every DNA binding protein uh, every, at every time point in the cell's life cycle. So I just wanna try and give you a flavor for, for what the state of the art is, is currently able to do. Uh, so so uh, the animation illustrates what, what the, <coughs> these simulations can predict for individual cells, but we can also use them to predict behaviors of populations of cells. So one thing that, that we focused on is the distribution of the growth rate of individual cells, uh, and we can validate that against experimental data. 
but because we, we have detailed models, we can also investigate further. So we can also look at the distribution of the lengths of individual phases of the cell cycle. For example, how long it takes to replicate DNA. And then you can use this information to reason about how cells regulate the length of their cell cycle. Uh, you can also make predictions about data, which is difficult, if not impossible, to, to validate experimentally. Uh, so one example of that is this predicted locations of DNA binding proteins throughout the cell cycle. Uh, there is one experimental technique called ChIP-seq, which uh, allows you to quantitate the population and temporal average of this. Uh, but using a model, you, you get the full dynamics as well, uh, which you don't get in experiments. And you can drill down even further in the, in the experiments and you can look at not just where proteins bind, but how they interact. You can look at how they collide and the frequency of these collisions. Uh, another thing that, that's really interesting to look at is how cells use energy. So you can, in particular, we've done this, you can quantitate the total amount of energy that cells consume, and then you, or at least you, you can total up the amount of energy that that your in silico cell consumes, and then you can compare that to how much energy a real cell consumes. And what we find is that there's a big difference. So that means that there's a lot of physiology that we're not accounting for, despite how comprehensive these models are. So going forward, we think that's a, an interesting metric for uh, quantitating how completely we understand cell physiology. Um, and then we've also been very interested in predicting the effects of genetic and environmental perturbations. Um, so you can predict what happens when you delete a gene or add a gene or modify a gene or increase or decrease expression of that gene. Um, and, and you can look at the physiology of those uh, mutants. So I just want to quickly um, give you a, a sense of how we think about validating these models, the kind of experimental data that we use. Um, so th the basic idea that we've been pursuing is to develop a long checklist of individual validation steps uh, each of which gives you a lot, a little bit of confidence in the model predictions, but together give you a lot. Uh, so the, the first um, sort of set of items on our checklist is to make sure that the model matches all the data that you use to train it, which is, is basically just to say that you, uh, that whatever you put into the model, you can get out. Um, and of course, the next thing that you want to do is to make sure that the model matches other data, which has been published by other groups, but which you didn't use to train the model. And then you can go into your own lab and you can quantitate additional data, uh, which you didn't use to, again, to, to build the model, so which is truly independent. And what we and others tend to focus on is, is traits which are relatively easy to quantitate, like how fast an organism grows or how long the cell cycle is or how long DNA replication is. And, and then do that across perturbations which are relatively clean and relatively easy to interpret like genetic perturbations. Uh, and then you can also make sure that these models um, match biological theories and then also develop tests of your software. So lastly, I just want to uh, give a, a little bit of introduction to how uh, people in our field are thinking about using these kinds of models to engineer biological organisms. So the, the key question in, in this field of synthetic biology is how to design a genome to have a particular engineering or to, to maximize a particular engineering objective. And that could be something like maximize the growth rate of an organism or maximize the rate at which the organism produces a fuel or it could be a drug or some other com commodity chemical. So, so graphically, the idea is, is uh, what are all the genes that need to be inserted into the genome or removed or whose expression level, which is the, the abundance of the, the gene product, um, need to be tuned in order to maximize your, your, this particular question that you're interested in. And w what we've focused on recently is trying to maximize the growth rate of mycoplasmas. Uh, and we focused on that largely because mycoplasmas grow somewhat slowly, and if we could make them grow faster, that, that might turn them into a better engineering platform. So the way that, that we've been thinking about this um, in our own work is to just to simply ask, if we could only make one modification to a genome to maximize the growth rate, what gene should we overexpress in order to increase the growth rate the most? Uh, and it turns out that that's a, uh, the details aren't important, but it, it turns out to be a metabolic enzyme. But I if you increase the, uh, the expression of one gene, you, you can't increase the growth rate very much. Uh, 
But if, if you sort of repeat this analysis iteratively, you can, you can find a set of genes uh, which, if you overexpress all of them, then you can increase the growth rate significantly. So once you have an optimized genome, then you want to make sure that the genome is going to be stable, that uh, once you're selecting for some optimal property that you haven't somehow sacrificed uh, robustness or, or um, other beneficial properties of the cell. So you can ask, for example, what's the distribution of the growth rate under your optimized architecture compared to the wild type? Um, and it seems like, at least in our own work, that you don't necessarily have to trade off uh, <coughs> optimality under uh, of a specific condition uh, for robustness. So, so we think that that's promising for the future. So, um, so where does sort of sim systems biology fit, or these these whole cell models fit in in, set in, in synthetic biology? So, uh, at least the, the my own perspective is that in the future, uh, the way that biological organisms might be uh, designed is that a bioengineer will, will come to and sit in front of a, a computer in their office and they'll use a graphical design tool, much like a mechanical engineer might use CAD right now, to design an, an organism. And um, they'll specify, essentially use that to specify some sort of engineering objective, which is whatever chemical um, they want to synthesize. And then that'll be translated into some high-level language, and then we'll use a whole cell model to actually uh, select a particular DNA sequence to maximize this, this particular goal. And then we'll physically implement that into the DNA using uh, technology that's uh, being developed at the Craig Venture Institute and transplant that into a re recipient cell, also using uh, technology from the Craig Venture Institute. Um, so my gr group at Mount Sinai is working on expanding the scope of these kinds of models um, applying them to new kinds of questions like drug repurposing and drug discovery uh, and personalized medicine and developing new tools to make these kinds of models uh, easier to work with for ourselves and others. Um, okay, so I just wanted to conclude with some thoughts on where this field is going and what, what some of the important questions are. So I think in the next several years, probably where the, the field will be focusing is on uh, how to model more complex physiology and how to model more complex and multicellular organisms. Um, but I, I think ultimately, the way that we're gonna be able to build comprehensive models of, of human cells for medicine is through a much more collaborative approach than, than the field is currently taking. Uh, and I think th what that's gonna require is a, a large collaboration among uh, groups across the world. And we're, we'll recruit experts in all these different areas of physiology to come and help us build models of each of these areas of physiology, incorporating the latest data uh, and the latest mathematical models. Um, and then if through, I think, appropriate use of good software engineering tools and uh, good interfaces between these submodels, we'll be able to integrate them together uh, into a single unified theory. Um, okay, so, so just to summarize quickly, um, the wholesome models can be used to, to integrate heterogeneous data and, um, and mathematical models into a single unified theory. And we can use these models to uh, comprehensively predict cell physiology. And I think in the future, these are gonna be very powerful tools uh, for biological design as, as well as for personalized medicine. Um, so thank you very much. And